Yeah, it's such a pleasure to be here. So what I'm going to be talking to you um, today about is some work that I'm doing in conjunction with Lee Anderson, who's a professor in the Department of Architecture. And our goal is to figure out how to use virtual environments technology to um, facilitate the process of conceptual design in architecture. So um, Lee's insight uh, is that designs are influenced by the tools that are used to create them. And in traditional CAD software design process, um, uh, the designer is large with respect to the model. Um, the designer is external with respect to the model. The model exists solely within the confines of the screen. And the interaction with the model is cumbersome and non-intuitive. And, and that characterizes, th that process um, characterizes the, um, the results of the design process. So what Lee has observed through his 20 years of teaching is that um, he, when he looks at a design, he can tell whether the design was created on a computer, whether it was created, what tools people use to create the design. Um, designs that are created using CAD software have a privileged emphasis on the external form because when you interact with your design, you're thinking of it as a small object um, that's uh, aesthetic from a bird's eye point of view, um, rather than thinking about the design, conceptualizing the design from the point of view of the occupants of the building. Um, design with the CAD software also leads to conceptualizing design from a single preferred vantage point. That's because it's cumbersome to, to spin the model around to look at it from the different sides. So you get these designs that are designed from the point of view of the front, and then the sides and the back are just kind of patched on as an afterthought rather than you know, evolving in an organic fashion um, holistically. And there's also a tendency to produce forms that are aesthetic with respect to the aspect ratio of the screen. And this also is, is true with pencil and paper. You, know, you, you take the frame into consideration when you're thinking about how, what you want to design. So with um, virtual environments technology, um, we have the potential to allow the designer to reintegrate his egocentric um, frame of reference into the design process so that you can, as a designer, you can design creations from the point of view of being inside them. And clients can make decisions um, based on the designs that are equivalent to the decisions that they would make um, in the real world. And the, um, the trick with this is that we have to ensure somehow that the spatial perception in the virtual environments is going to be equivalent to spatial perception in the real world. So for example, um, we recently re remodeled our house. And one of the decisions we had to make is, do you want the eight foot ceilings? Do you want the nine foot ceilings? The nine foot ceilings are going to be $3,000 more. And so you know, that's a, a decision that only we as clients can make for ourselves, because you know, we know what $3,000 means to us, and we know what the, the extra spaciousness means to us. And if we put on head mind display, and we look at our, our room, and we make a decision, and then we get to the real room, and it's not the same thing, then you know, that's a recipe for disappointment. So we created many years ago this um, immersive design environment. And the goal here was to allow people to be in a real space. Um, this is our lab at the time, sit down at a table in a chair, put on the head and on display, and find themselves in um, another place. So in this case, it was the um, architecture courtyard. We could sit down at the table. We would map onto the table um, uh, the plan of the building. You could design on the table. Um, and you could see it there in life size. You could get up, walk around, look at it, come back, sit down, refine the design. We had these boards. You could um, paste um, pictures and videos and other things that would help inspire you in the design process, because design doesn't happen in a vacuum. And designers tend to surround themselves with um, things that will help stimulate their creativity. And so getting back to the question of spatial perception in immersive virtual environments. Um, the, um, a lot of research has been done in this area. It's been recognized for many, many years that people tend to severely underestimate um, egocentric distances in virtual environments that are presented with head-mounted display systems. So this was some of the early work in the, in the early 1990s found this, and it was continued to be a problem for many, many years. And so many people have looked at this problem um, investigating different factors and largely ruling them out as the root causes of the underestimation. So for example, um, people started looking at, well, what are all the differences between the virtual environments experience and a real world experience? Well, in the virtual environments experience, you've got a limited field of view. So what people would do is they say, OK, 
will take you out into the real world, have you make distance judgments, have you wear some blinders that narrow your field of view, have you make some distance judgments again, and see how the, the narrowing of the field of view affects things. And they found out it didn't affect things at all. Um, and also, they looked at the inability to see one's body. In a head mount display, you're disembodied view. Um, in the real world, you've got yourself. So when they had experiments in the real world that would block off the view of your body, um, ask you to make distance judgments, and have you make distance judgments, and you could see your body, they found no difference. So then the conclusion was, well, the inability to see your body isn't the root cause of the distance underestimation. The same thing, quality of the computer graphics, um, the ergonomics of the head mounted display, and then even people started looking at, well, maybe the metric that we're using to measure distance, you know, there's something wrong with the metric. Um, so people developed this blind throwing metric, triangular walking, and, and other things to see if, if maybe, you know, it was the metric was the problem, and, and it didn't seem so. So we had this, this mystery of, you know, why were people underperceiving the distances. Um, so over the past couple of years, we've, well, past many years now, we've conducted a whole series of experiments looking at this problem and trying to seek insights that we can um, apply to, um, to be able to help the architecture students uh, make better use of our virtual environments um, equipment. And so I, I'm kind of giving you a, a preview. So our um, study suggested that the root of the problem um, doesn't lie in the lower level um, features of the stimulus, but rather in the higher level cognitive factors that influence how we interpret what we see. Um, this view started out extremely controversial. It remains a little bit controversial. Um, but nevertheless, it's been really helpful to us in guiding um, um, our, our strategies for seeking to overcome the problem. So our first key finding was that um, we found a special case um, of an example where people didn't severely underestimate distances in a virtual environment. And we stumbled on this result by accident. Um, so our intention was to try to investigate the extent to which um, distance accuracy could be improved by allowing people to um, have some exposure to the virtual environment, get into the virtual environment, walk around, interact with things, become more comfortable, and then see, um, and then see if that makes a difference. So we created a 3D photorealistic replica of our lab. Um, and we tested dis distance perception accuracy under four conditions. So first, we had people do baseline measures um, in the real room. Um, so what we would do is we, would, we had um, six pieces of tape we put down on the floor. You stand at one piece of tape, take your aim at the next piece of tape, close your eyes, walk to where you thought the next piece of tape was. We would measure how far you had walked. We know how far you were supposed to walk. So they did this first in the real room, then in the virtual replica room, then we had them put on the head mount display and do some virtual, some interactions um, with an engaging experience, and then we post-tested in the real world again to see if there was any effective adaptation. Um, so this is what it looked like at the time. This is our real room. Um, that's my PhD student, Brian Reese, and John Kanitsky, who is the PhD student of Gary Myers. Um, and this is the virtual replica room. So this was Lee Anderson created this in SketchUp by basically measuring the entire room, taking photographs of all the surfaces, and factor mapping the photographs onto the real room. And it was you know, stunningly similar. Um, this is the, the haptic interaction we had people do. We set up a table. The people were encouraged to touch the table. Um, and then they were. We had a model here, and they used our GL Creator system that I showed you before to replicate that model on the other side of the table. And that was just an exercise that we gave people to standardize the amount of time that they spent in the room and, and the amount of interaction they had. And what we were hoping to find was that by giving people this interaction, we would um, try to mitigate the distance underestimation problem. Well, what we found was really surprising. So the gray line is ground truth. Um, the dark blue is the baseline virtual reality, so, um, and the cyan is what we found um, in terms of their accuracy after the experience. And so this was um, you know, a situation where, where researchers before us had found underestimations in the order of 20 to 50 percent. And we were finding in the baseline case um, you know, something like a little bit under two feet out of 30 feet, and, and pretty much you know, negligible at the at the lower um, levels. And so um, you know, we, were, we were kind of surprised because you know, 
at this point, people had thought, well, you know, it's, it's an intractable consequence of the, of the technology, this underestimation. You guys are not finding it. Um, you know, what is it? You know, is it because you've got the highest quality hardware? We're using third track um, uh, sensors, um, third track sensors, you know, really, really fast. You know, we had a, the state of the art head mount display. So maybe it was just that our hardware was really high quality. Um, maybe it was a result of the high quality of our model. You know, we had these photorealistic textures. It was very convincing. Um, we did distortion correction so that there was no problems with the pincushion. Um, or was it an artifact of our experimental methodology? I mean, we had people come into the room. There were six pieces of tape on the floor. Um, they did it first in the real world. Maybe they just remembered what they had done and did the same thing in, in the next couple of um, of conditions, and so maybe it was just an artifact, the results that we were finding. So we um, redesigned the experiment and retested. And the second time, um, we, we, com we did it completely differently. All the distances are random. and the presentation order between the real and the virtual rooms was counterbalanced between participants. So it took us a while to get that done. In the meantime, we put this large display system in our lab. Um, this is the rear projected screen that we architected into the room so that we could allow people to, to suspend disbelief and to treat it as a virtual reality window into a different location. Um, and we, we debug it by showing the rest of the room behind it and making sure that that's stable and, and works. Anyway, so this is Brian again modeling the head-mounted display. Um, this is the photorealistic replica room, again, created in SketchUp, texture mapped with photographs of the real space. Um, and there you can see a tape mark on the floor, so people had to close their eyes and walk to the tape mark. Um, we had these unfortunate boxes on the floor, um, but they got um, represented in the virtual room as well. Um, and so when we, because the, the, this time, you know, previously we would have, so okay, so everybody would walk five feet, 10 feet, 15 feet. We couldn't do that this time because the computer would randomly pick a spot on the floor to put the tape. So everybody was walking different distances, so we had to think of a different way to look at our data. So the way that, that, that to interpret this data is we've got absolute error in the real world across the horizontal axis. So if people are, are dead on, they would be at zero. If they underestimate, they would be over here. If they overestimate, they would be over there. What we have here is um, error in the virtual world, if they underestimate, they're over here. If they overestimate, they're over there. And what each one of these dots is, is the, the results from a particular participant. So each person served as their own control. This turned out to be a really, really valuable thing to do. Um, people hadn't been doing this in the past, but we've, and you'll see some slides later where, where the, the merits of this approach you know, are, are really clear. So what happens is that if a person um, underestimates or overestimates um, their performance in the virtual world relative to the real world is, is really captured by the distance of the points from this line. So if, you're, if the point lies along the line, it means that they're behaving similarly. They have a similar amount of um, error in the real world and the virtual world. And so what I've done is I've color-coded these points. If they're hollow, it means that there's no significant difference between the real world and the virtual world performance. If they're solid, it means that the difference is significant um, at um, at the 95% level. And so here you can see that we basically you know, replicated our results of before, where it's kind of a wash. There is no systematic major underestimation of distances um, in the virtual environment. So this case, real first, is people came into the lab. They did distance estimates in the lab. They put on the head mount. They were back in the lab. They did the distance estimates. And there was no significant difference. So this is the group that came into the lab, put on the head mount did the distance estimates, took off the head mount, did the distance estimates again. Basically the same um, qualitatively similar um, results. And so, um, so, so these findings, you know, to us, um, represented the first clear example that it was not an intractable problem, this problem of distance underestimation in, in virtual environments. And this was really encouraging. Um, even though you know it's not that exciting to be able to say, well, you know, you can in a virtual model the same exact place, you know, at the same exact time, that people do, don't underestimate distances. At least we know now that that it's not something inherent in the display. Um, we still didn't quite understand. I mean, at this point, the the basis of the findings wasn't clear. Was it the fact that it was co-located? You knew you were in the room. You put on the head mount. You were still in the room. Um, you know, it could have still been the result of the hardware because nothing in the testing. Um, ruled that out. Or, you know, maybe there was something in our testing procedure that was allowing people to cheat. You know, I don't 
think that there was, but you know, that's a possibility. Um, so what was missing from, from this was replicating the results of, of prior studies. So you know, at, at this point, all we've done is a bunch of tests that showed that people didn't underestimate distances in our virtual environment. So what we did is at this point we had to, well, we decided to create a 3D replica of another real space that wasn't our co-located lab. And this situation would allow us to replicate the um, previous studies by other people. So this was a hallway up on the fourth floor of our building. It's a key, keyed access only hallway. I used to have permission to go up there. I don't have that permission anymore. Um, it's, uh, the ceilings are about seven and a half feet tall. Um, and it's fairly narrow. Anyway, this is what it looks like. Um, Lee Anderson, my architecture colleague, went up to the hallway, measured everything, created a really detailed 3D model and sketch. So everything's modeled in 3D. The handles of the doors, the, the, the little trim, the lights, they're recessed. I mean, everything is, is there and texture mapped with photos from the actual hallway. There's a bit of a color shift. Uh, um, the virtual model's a little more blue than the real thing, but it's very, very um, compellingly um, similar. And so what we did is we had people come into the lab. Half the people would walk into our lab. They would put on the head mount display, and they would see this highly realistic model of a hallway that they'd never been to before. They would make distance judgments. Then they would go up to the hallway. They would make real world distance judgments, and we would compare the real and the virtual world. And the other half did it in the other order. And so what did we find? So we found that pretty much you know, everybody the, the majority of the people underestimated. I mean, we do have this one person who's just right dead on in, in the real world and the virtual world. And we always get you know, a couple of, of people who are like that. And we were trying to figure out, you know, we have some other research I'll talk about a little later, trying to get at you know, what is different about this person. But anyway, we, know we, we, we basically replicated the findings that other people had had. We had underestimation in the, um, in the virtual environment. And this is what we found for people who went up to the hallway made distance estimates, came down to the room, put on the head mount display, and they were back in the hallway. And the first time we looked at this data, we actually didn't plot it this way. The first time we looked at the data, we just looked at the average. And we concluded, oh, they're underestimating distances in both cases. We plotted the data this way. What we noticed is, well, actually, four people are kind of right on the line. And there's only one person who's severely underestimating. And so that kind of made us um, you know, think a little bit more about what was going on here. Um, so, so these results um, suggest that there's something special about either the co-location or the pre-exposure that's affecting people's responses. It, we're not getting distance, um, you know, it, but, but it, still could be, it still could be the case. I mean, so now what we had is we had a case where people were walking accurately in the room and walking short in the hallway. And it could be that people are walking short in the hallway because um, the hallway is long and narrow, and the room is, is big and wide. Maybe people underestimate distances in narrow spaces. Um, the, the hallway has a lot of polygons, a lot more polygons in the room. You know, maybe there's you know, some small amount of lag, and that's the lag is causing people to, to underestimate the distances in the hallway because it just doesn't feel as real. Um, so in order to test that, what we needed to do was to, um, to disassemble our tracking system, bring it up to the hallway, and reverse the roles of the hallway in the room. So this, unfortunately, I had a hard disk failure on my computer, so I've only got the top of the picture. But anyway, it, it does the, if you can sort of see, it's a little bit dark, but there's Lee and one of the participants doing the experiment up in the hallway. So what we did there is we brought people up to the hallway, they, um, half the people would put on the head mount display, do distance judgments in the hallway, take them off, do distance judgments in the real hallway. Um, and the other half would come up to the hallway, put on the head mount display, see the room that they'd never been to because it's a locked room with, you know, in, a, in a place with no windows, um, do distance judgments in the room, and then go down to the real room and do the, the real world control. Um, so we had these. Um, these four different conditions which we counterbalanced between participants. Um, and what did we find? OK, so the people who came up to the hall, um, did distance judgments in the hall, put on the head mind display, did distance judgments in the virtual hall, you know, 
th there's no underestimation that, that we can see. So it's not because the hall has more polygons. It's not because the hall is long and narrow. Um, it, it has to do with the fact that they're in the hall. They put on the head mount. They're still in the hall. Um, when we have the virtual hall first, same thing. You can see that participant up in the corner there. Um, this is the reason that having every person is their own control is really, really useful. So here's a person who's just an overachiever. I mean, there's the mark. They walk to the mark, and they walk. They just keep walking. Um, but they're consistent about it, and they do it in the real world and in the virtual world. And so it didn't throw us off. It didn't lead us to incorrect conclusions, because we were able to control for that, because this person was their own con control. So what happens for people who, um, who go up to the hallway, put on the head mount, and they see themselves in this room? OK, sorry. <laughs> this, these are the people who went down to the room, saw the room, did the distance judgments, went up to the hallway, put on the head mount. They were still in the room. Again, you know, kind of a wash. We have that one outlier up there. You know, I don't know what um, was going on with that participant. Um, but you know, we, we basically don't have consistent underestimation in that case. Um, this is what happens when we have people come up to the hallway, put on the head mount, and see the room that they've never been to before. We get the classic underestimation. So, so this really helped us to understand and to, to narrow down the situations you know, in which people tend to underestimate distances in virtual environments. Unfortunately, this is like the most common case of when you would want to use a virtual environment, is to put people in a place that they've never been before um, to represent a new place. Yeah, we, we were, Lee has a, a blind friend who he swears uses echolocation to get around with his bicycle, but he doesn't like bump into trees and things like that. So we had people wear um, a portable radio that you strap onto your arms, and, and it would just play kind of um, static noise into your ears. Um, we started out by having people, in our very first experiments, we started out by having people wear those earplugs that you buy at Home Depot, <coughs> but they don't really work. Um, and so we found it was better to just distract people with, um, with noise. And so there were no instructions. I mean, people were, were given the instructions ahead of time. We had the written instructions that we would have people read so to make sure that everybody, their task was explained in the same way to all people. OK, so, so by this point, we were you know, fairly, we at least we had convinced ourselves that um, there was a case, a very, very special and limited case, but a case in which people don't underestimate estimates in virtual environments. And that was the case where the virtual environment is a very high fidelity replica of a real environment that people either know they're presently co-located in or that they've recently experienced. Um, we didn't test the case where we blindfold people um, outside, bring them into our lab, have them keep their eyes closed and put on the head mount display, because I think that would be the same thing as you know, bringing them into our lab and showing them the hallway. It's, you know, um, it's, uh, yeah. So the implications of this are in that, um, well, what, what we've learned from this is that when we have architecture students come into our lab and develop models of small <coughs> objects, um, we let them work within the, 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 um, the context of our virtual room. Because previously, with the GL Creator system, we would just have this vast, empty white space. We had this kiosk where people could, you know, um, they had they used the highball to choose items, and um, it was actually, yeah, quite a nice system. They could get textures and apply them to surfaces. It's kind of like SketchUp in 3D, um, but this was developed before SketchUp. Um, anyway, so they would model in the in the vast white space, and what they um, what they found after we started encouraging them to model in the room is that there, there was a context for the sizes of the objects. And so they weren't surprised at you know, how big their chair was. So, so that's you know, one small thing that we've learned from this. But the, um, but the problem is that in most cases, the virtual environment you know, doesn't represent the same place as, as you're in. And so the remaining open questions at this point were, um, we still don't know, you know, what's the root cause of people's greater accuracy in these replica environments? Um, is it, you know, my hypothesis was that people were, it, it, the, the illusion is that when you put on the head mount display, 
when you're in the room, you put on the head mount display and you still see the room, it's just this compelling illusion that you're putting on a set of see-through cameras. Everybody waves their hands in front of their face and says, you know, I can't see myself or I can't see you. And they look down and I can't see my feet. And, and people would never say that you know, before because there was no expectation that you would see yourself. But in this case, you know, the expectation is if it looks like a camera, behaves like a camera, why can't I see myself, why can't I see you? Um, and so we, our hypothesis is that people are, um, are suspending disbelief and interpreting you know, what they're seeing as if it was you know, an actual real view. Um, but you know, that might not necessarily be the, the explanation. Maybe it could be that you know, people are, um, are looking at the space, making a, a mental model of the size of the space, and then using that to scale um, their interpretations. Um, and then the other um, open question is, OK, you know, it's great that we can let people have accurate distance perception when we put them in an exact replica of an existing real space, but that doesn't solve the problem of how do we enable people to um, have accurate spatial perception in, in novel virtual environments. So our next experiment, the goal of our next experiment was to disambiguate this presence hypothesis from the spatial memory hypothesis. And in order to do that, we designed an experiment in which we created three um, surreptitiously different um, virtual models of our room. So one model was surreptitiously smaller by 10%, one model was surreptitiously larger by 10%, and the other one was an exact copy. And we used a between-subjects design because otherwise people would catch on to what we were doing. Um, and in every case, we explicitly told people, we're going to put you in a virtual environment that's an exact model of your same environment. And we're, we're trying to, um, we told people that we were, tr we were looking at distance perception accuracy in virtual environments, and we were going to ask them to do distance judgments in the real environment, in the virtual environment. And we wanted to, them to tell us everything about the virtual environment that was different from the real environment so that we could improve our virtual environments um, rendering and, and presentation. So all the participants, did they, they came into the room, they put on the head mount, and they, they saw the virtual room. They did the trials in the virtual room, then they took it off, they did the trials in the real room. We, always, we had all the virtual trials first because um, in the co-located condition, we hadn't seen a significant effect of order, and we thought it was important to give them the virtual experience first so that they wouldn't have the real experience you know, to, to maybe bias their interpretation of what they saw in the virtual world. We thought that if they spent too much time walking around the real room thinking about distances, they might notice that the virtual one was a different size. So um, this is what it looks like. This is our same sized room. This is our surreptitiously <coughs> smaller room. This is our surreptitiously larger room. So when we created these models, we had to be really careful not to just apply a global scale because doors are seven feet tall. They're always seven feet tall. They have to stay seven feet tall. Um, so what we did is we used Photoshop to just you know, take out the white space to make the smaller room and to add with the clone tool extra white space in for the, um, for the big room. And so when you see them all side by side, you know, they look very different. But when you're just in the room, you put on the head mount, you've been primed to believe that it's the same model. Um, you know, we don't think that people, people caught on. So our hypothesis is that if people are coming into the room taking a mental you know, a measurement of the room, saying, OK, I see that wall. It's 30 feet away, um, and I'm going to remember that. And they get into the virtual environment. They see a spot that's halfway to the far wall. They're like, OK, that spot is 15 feet. But actually, they're in the surreptitiously um, larger room. So in the surreptitiously larger room, if they walk 15 feet, they're not going to get halfway. Um, in the surreptitiously smaller room, if they walk 15 feet, they're going to walk over. Um, so we expected that people would underestimate distances in the surreptitiously larger room and overestimate distances in the surreptitiously smaller room if they were using spatial memory to calibrate their interpretation of what they saw in the virtual environment. Did, did I say that too fast? Or is that clear? OK. Um, if instead people's um, accuracy is, is just a reflection of the extent to which they feel present in the virtual environment, then we should expect equivalently accurate distance estimates under all of the three room size conditions. Um, because if people don't um, recognize that you've changed something, then you know, why should it be different? So here's what we found. I'm going to start with the results of the same room. Um, every time we would do this, every time we would replicate this experiment, we kind of hold our breath because, um, you know, to see if we got the same thing. But this is, you know, yeah, the third replication, and it was, you know, pretty much the same. You have 
you know, some people that underestimate, um, and you know, but but most of the um, <coughs> of the action is right along the line. So in the same size group, people were performing equivalently in the in the real and the virtual room. So let's see what happens in the large room. So remember, the spatial memory hypothesis, if, you, if the real room is 30 feet, there's a point in the middle um, you think is 15 feet away. If it's in the larger room, you walk 15 feet, you're not going to get to the middle. And that's what we found. You know, in, the, in the surreptitiously larger room, the majority of people underestimated. So this you know, sort of um, confirms the spatial memory hypothesis. So now if we look at what happens in the smaller room, we would expect to see all the points on top of the line. So this is what happens in the smaller room. They're all under the line again. And so this kind of you know, was puzzling to us because you know, it, it doesn't confirm the spatial memory hypothesis. It doesn't really confirm the, the presence um, hypothesis either, even though you know, you, if, if you really want to believe it, you can you know, create a, a spin for yourself that will allow you to interpret these results in a way that's compatible with the presence hypothesis. So you say that on some subconscious level, people realized that the virtual world was a little bit off, and perhaps they were punting and, and underestimating out of, um, out of um, in, in um, yeah, uh, uncertainty. But it could be that people, you know, if you think about like how we implemented it. So we had a real room that was 30 feet. We had um, a larger room that was, you know, maybe 36 feet, and a smaller room that was maybe, you know, 25 feet. And we were generating a random distance from um, that was between 8 to 22 feet away from where you were standing. And so, you know, 22 feet is going to get you a lot closer to the far wall in the short room in the small room than it is in the large room. We wanted to make sure that people were, that everyone in the three conditions was asked to walk the same distances because we did find that, um, that, um, that you know, the smaller distances would have you know, less um, error than the larger distances. So could it be that people were just afraid of walking into a wall in the smaller room? So to look at that, you know, I pulled on my visualization <laughs> hat and I decided to just look at all the data. So what we have here is a top-down view of the room, um, and every path that people walk is, um, is marked. So let's see. I'm going to use my, um, my mouse here. So um, what you can see here, let's just take this one for example. It, the green are the paths where people overwalked, and the length from the well, let's see where, when you can see the arrow. So the length from the tip to the, to the end is the amount that they did walk, and the black is the amount they were supposed to walk. So the green is the amount of overwalking. Um, the red is where they underwalked. So the whole thing is what they were supposed to do, and the black is what they actually did do. So what you can see here is you have some people who consistently underestimate. You have some people who seem to consistently overestimate, um, but you don't see a lot of red marks um, at the wall. I mean, actually, what you tend to see is green on the wall. I mean, here you can see a person who actually walked into the wall. We weren't supposed to let people walk into the wall, but the data don't lie, and the line really touches the wall. Um, so it doesn't seem, and, and, and if you look at, like, say, participant here, T you can see these overestimates on the longer distances, um, and actually they tend to walk shorter on the, on the shorter distances. So this you know, indicated to us that, that it wasn't a case of people being afraid to walk into a wall, you know, almost, almost on the contrary, because you can see it again with this person here. Um, and there's also you know, the same thing. Here's the smaller sized room, or the actual sized room. And here's the larger room. So one of the things you notice about the larger room is, you know, everybody's pretty much underestimated. You've got a few, you know, folks who walk long, um, but, but you do see a lot of um, of red. Um, and so, so what this made us think is, well, maybe people are just, you know, if you have a spot in the middle of the room, there's there's really nothing there for context. So you know, maybe we're we're just getting these errors when we have. Um, you know, a spot in the middle of the floor, you know, isolated from, from anything else that could, uh-huh. Yes, yes. No, we just, we just walk behind. Um, 
you know, usually people don't. I mean, we've never had anybody like hurt themselves walking into the law. Um, See, the person who's following behind um, doesn't know how far the person, they have no way of knowing how far the person is supposed to walk. So you're just trying to you know, make sure that the cables are, are comfortable. But yeah, that, that's a good question. You know, if, if you did know how far they were supposed to walk, you know, then you might start you know, just, just unconsciously kind of holding them back. Um, but yeah, it, it, I mean, the pictures kind of show that that, that didn't happen. Um, so, so anyway, maybe we thought that, well, maybe what happens is people are walking short in the, in the larger room because of lack of sufficient detail. So um, what we decided to do was to add detail. So here's our real room, and here's a virtual a model of our room where we added furniture. So here you can really see the shortcomings in our, um, in our rendering. You know, the, the shading is, is terrible. Um, but at least the geometry is, is more or less correct. Anyway, so we had the, we took the, the surreptitiously larger room, we added these familiar sized objects. Um, you know, in looking back on it, it's like, why should I think that adding familiar sized objects would help? We've got doors in the room. I mean, what could be a better ruler than a door? Um, you know, adding these chairs and tables. Anyway, so what we found was um, that, yeah, it didn't make any difference. People still underwalked. Okay, so moving on. Um, yeah, I should actually move on a little bit faster here. Okay, so, um, so it's great that we can you know, get people to be accurate in a virtual replica room, but most of the time, you know, that's not what we want to do. So one possibility is to let people start in a replica environment and then transition from the replica environment into another environment. We um, did some work jointly with Frank Steinecke, or actually Frank Steinecke mostly did this work with you know, a little bit of interaction from, from my student where he created a virtual replica room, created a portal, and he had people start in the virtual replica room, walk through the portal, and then find themselves in a different environment. He looked at, the, um, at whether people who entered the, the new environment through the portal after having experienced the replica environment experienced or, or uh, showed less distance underestimation than people who just put on the head mount and saw themselves in this uh, external environment. And he did find that the um, the experience in the, um, in the replica environment did help. Um, in fact, we're, I'm, I have another um, experiment that I, I'm not talking about today that's joint with um, a person from the memory clinic. We're looking at using virtual environments to test prospective memory in folks with dementia and Alzheimer's. And, and we do the same thing where we have people put on the head mount display, find themselves still in our room. They become comfortable with how the head mount display works. And then we fade them out and bring them back up in the, in the test environment so that they can just have that transition. Um, so another possibility is if we really think that the issue is presence, you know, which, which I did um, and I still do, then maybe we should try to do something that will help people to feel more present in the virtual environment. And what the researchers in presence had said for many, many years was that they emphasized the importance of giving people a self-embodiment. So we thought that this was an answered question. I mean, people had done the experiments and they basically ruled it out. But you know, I started thinking about it and it's like, okay, in the real world, you don't let people see your body. You still have a body. You know it's there even if you can't see it. In the virtual environment, you know, there's some ambiguity. If you don't have a body, you're a disembodied view. You're a camera. You could be you know, floating in space anywhere looking at the virtual world from any point of view, I don't think it necessarily follows that people would immediately interpret that, that that's the view from their, for their own eyes. So, so it hadn't been shown that giving people an embodiment in a virtual environment wouldn't help. So um, yeah, so, so at this point I decided I wanted a motion capture system and it was like $100,000 and it took me a year and a half to convince people to, that, that this was an okay um, thing to spend money on, but finally it worked. Um, and we were able to do these experiments. Um, so we did a um, bunch of different experiments. I'm going to try to, um, to go through them uh, quickly here. We had a case where people had the no avatar. That was the baseline. We had a high fidelity avatar. And when I say high fidelity, you have to kind of put that in quotes. That was the highest fidelity that we <coughs> could do at the time, um, which meant that he was fully motion tracked and fully texture mapped. And then we created two cases this, um, of, of 
deprecated models, a, a stiff avatar and a, and a dot avatar. Um, and the stiff avatar, we had the same texture map geometry, but we only tracked um, one point, so the avatar would move. With the dot avatar, we had full motion tracking, but we only showed the motion track markers. I guess I have that on the, on the next slide. So with the stiff avatar, people would suit up, assume a neutral pose, um, and then as they moved forward, their avatar would just stiffly glide forward. Um, with a dot avatar, we w the idea was that we told people, okay, the way that this system works is that when you put on the head mount display, you're not going to be able to see yourself, but you are going to be able to see these markers that we put on you. Um, so people were primed to, to know that they were going to be seeing the markers, only the markers. And we thought that if this works, then it kind of finesses the problem of, of, of the avatar representation. People have you know, the dot experiments um, that you can really see motion from, from, you can understand motion from the motion of the dots. You know, we had high hopes for this. Anyway, so this is our, ca our motion capture system. This is Mike Caden. He was an undergraduate. He worked in our lab for about five years. Um, did you know a, a lot of great stuff, and he's he's modeling the suit. Um, here's the avatar that Mike chose for everyone. Um, so everybody was him. Um, and here's the virtual hallway. Because remember, we had found no distance est underestimation in a virtual room, so we couldn't test people in the virtual room. But we had found underestimation in the hallway. So now people would come into our lab, put on the head mount, see the hallway, and be asked to make distance judgments. Um, when they looked down, um, we had to, to design something into the experiment that would encourage people or force people to look down, but without making them realize that looking down and seeing themselves was something that they should like, be paying special attention to. So what we told them is, okay, the task is you've got a, a piece of tape on the floor, and you have to line up your feet with the starting tape, then look at the ending tape, and then make the distance judgments. And so that way it was just kind of transparent. For the people who didn't have an avatar, there was no starting tape, and they would just looked at the spot and, and where they were was the start, so we didn't have people looking. We didn't draw people's attention to the fact that they didn't have a body because we thought that that would be a little bit unfair as well. So anyway, this is what people saw when they looked down. This is what the stiff avatar looked like. I mean, we never really got the avatar rendering the way we wanted it, um, but fortunately, people didn't. We didn't have mirrors, so people didn't see themselves. Um, this is the dot avatar. We you know we don't have too many motion capture markers. Um, and this is what they saw when they looked down, which is a very, very sparse representation. Remember, all they, all they actually got to see was, you know, we would generate the tape at a random distance, 8 to 12 inches from their foot. So they basically just shuffled forward. So they had very little exposure to their avatar self-representation. I really want to do more work where we, where we get the avatar right and we have a mirror and we let people, you know, ex develop confidence in their ownership of the avatar and the mirror, but we haven't done that. Anyway, so this is what we found with the no avatar. You know, this is just the same data you've seen before. Um, with the high fidelity avatar, things got better, and this was really exciting. Um, with the stiff avatar, it was kind of a, a wash. I mean, it got for some people it got better, for some people it didn't, and it was. Um, and for the dot avatar, again, you know, people are underestimating. So we the overall average, you know. People are still underestimating with the full avatar, but they're underestimating by less. Um, with no avatar, they're doing badly. The dot avatar and the stiff avatar are not statistically significantly different from the no avatar condition. It kind of looks like they, they might be a little bit, but anyway, we didn't run enough subjects to get statistical significance on that. Um, Okay, so, so those results um, suggested to us that having a faithful avatar was really important. Both the geom geometric faithfulness and the motion faithfulness were important, but not because of the lower level cues that they provide. Because in the case of the stiff avatar, if you wanted to use, say, the length of your avatar's feet as a ruler, you had that in the stiff case, but people didn't use that. Um, and if you wanted to use the low level optic flow cues from, you know, you move your leg and you see the dot move, I mean, you had that in the dot avatar, but people didn't seem to be able to be using that. So it was the gestalt of having a faithful representation apart from the, 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 the individual components that we think was, was key to, to what we found. So, okay, I've got very little time. I've got so many things I want to tell you about. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the non-photorealistic vo virtual environments. So um, with the architects, um, you know, when they're creating a model, you know, a lot of times, you know, it, it's easy to make a model, you know, of an existing place by just going around and taking pictures of it. But if you're designing a model, you're just playing with design ideas, you're sketching out forms. 
what we wanted to be able to do was to allow architectural students to use virtual environments technology in the early phases of the design process. Um, and so previous research had suggested the quality of the computer graphics didn't matter. So we thought, well, wouldn't this be wonderful? You know, we could you know, put people in these non-photorealistic virtual environments and, um, and, and maybe it would work. So we decided to test this by creating a non-photorealistic version of our replica room um, and to see you know, what happened. So here's our virtual replica room again. This is just from another angle because I don't want to bore you with the same photograph over and over. Um, and this is the non-photorealistic style. So what we did is we just um, went on the texture maps themselves and drew lines on top of everywhere that we felt that an edge should be. Um, and this is the result. I mean, this is just the same data that I showed you before. This is what we found in the high fidelity room. And this is what we found in the non-photorealistic room. So what this shows is the quality of the computer graphic does matter. Um, you know, my, my hypothesis, you know, I don't think that the old experiments were flawed. I just think that the problem with the old experiments is that you know, they were looking at the non-co-located -lo case where people were always underestimating. So you're always underestimating. You always have a little bit of you know, uncertainty or disbelief about what you're seeing. If you take that already bad situation and you make it a little bit worse, you know, it doesn't get statistically significantly worse. That doesn't mean that, um, that taking the top and making it better you know, wouldn't make a difference anyway. So that's what we found. Um, so the quality of the rendering seems to matter. There's a couple of explanations. Um, for the results, um, you know, again, it's you know, the see-through camera stuff that I talked about before. But what it could be, you know, so there's always, you know, I mean, I have my ideas, and then there's the ideas that, that I get reminded of when I send my papers in to be <laughs> reviewed. Um, and so, you know, it could be that, that when we did this non-photorealistic picture, we were just taking away all of the high-frequency texture detail, and that people were using that high-frequency texture detail to make their judgments about um, distances. So again, you know, I designed an experiment and said, OK, so if it's the lack of fine-grained texture cues that are making the difference, um, then you know, this would imply that we could improve things by adding some kind of high-frequency texture. Um, but if it's the disruption of the realism, then it means that any non-photorealistic rendering style would cause this problem. So we could have explored this question by implementing a whole bunch of different non-photorealistic rendering styles and comparing them. But you know, that's a lot of work, and it doesn't really get at the nugget of, of what we, we wanted to, um, to look at. And, and besides, I didn't think that that, that, that was going um, to be the, the answer. So what I decided to do is to take all of the white space in the non-photorealistic image and fill it up with the exact texture from the photograph. So here's our real room. Here's our non-photorealistic room. And this was the third model that I created. So I basically took all the white space and filled it back in with the texture. So now you've got a, a rendering that looks non-photorealistic. Um, I mean, you're not going to mistake that for something that you would see through a special see-through camera, but it's got all the high-frequency detail. So if, it's the, if the high frequency detail, if the lack of the high frequency detail was the problem, then what we should see is an under uh, that we should see accurate perception. If it's that it's non-photorealistic, then we should see um, a drop. Um, and what did we find? So here's our photorealistic replica. Here's our non-photorealistic replica. And here's with the lines. So it just adding those black lines on top of the image caused people to lose their confidence in being able to trust that it was what it was like a see-through camera image, caused them to perceive it as an artificial model. And then they, um, the, the uncertainties about how the affordances for action in that model, um, at least my hypothesis, is that's what causes them to underestimate. Um, OK. How much time should I leave for questions? Five minutes. Five minutes. Wow. OK, um, yeah, we gave people avatars in virtual environments, and it helped. That's not very interesting. Um, OK, this stuff is not interesting, so I'm just going to go through all that. Um, I really wanted to tell you about, I really wanted to tell you about this, the redirected driving, because this is like so close to my heart. Um, so the idea is that, um, so you're all familiar with redirected walking, obviously, because it was born here. Um, so what we want to do is we want to you know, augment that redirection idea with, um, with driving. So the idea is when distances are really long, 
um, sometimes it can be preferable to drive than to walk. So my daughter does a bunch of horse shows. They're spread out over these acres and acres, and everybody just rides around in golf carts because it takes you 20 minutes to walk from one side to the other. And I don't feel like if I was walking instead of riding in a golf cart, it would be building up you know, some kind of a less accurate spatial model of, of or understanding the spatial layout. Um, so, um, so what we've done is we have a motorized wheelchair, um, and we're doing um, a bunch of experiments to try to see, to probe the, the potential of using this motorized wheelchair for redirected um, driving. So we had a paper that just got accepted conditionally to um, IEEE-R, where we're just basically you know, measuring the, the, the low-level um, capabilities of, of tricking people in the wheelchair and comparing that to walking. Um, and what we found essentially is that um, if you're driving in a wheelchair, wearing a head-mount display, you feel like you're going faster than you really are. So already that gives you, you know, a one-point something um, gain that you can apply. So you, you can make your virtual room, you know, one-point something bigger than your than your real room just to make it feel right. We also found here that um, you can direct people on a curved path and. Uh, more of a curved path when they still think they're going straight. So there's there's some greater potential to redirect people. Um, you know the problem with with re I mean you know it, the the devil's advocate in me says okay well you know give somebody a joystick put them in a chair and you've got you know infinite redirectability. So the only way that, that this wheelchair idea would make any you know sense at all or be viable at all is if um, Traveling around an environment in a wheelchair gave you something over just sitting in a chair and driving with a joystick. Um, so we really need to understand if um, if your your spatial updating it will be more efficient with the wheelchair travel than with the joystick travel. So we had some um, undergraduate students come over the summer. They set up this experiment where it was a classical search task. So this is what the psychologists use when they um, try to look at spatial understanding. You've got six you've got 16 boxes. Eight of them you know when you touch them they turn red. The other eight you touch them they turn blue. Um, if you touch a red one again, it turns blue, so you don't know you found it. We had people, here's the wheelchair, we had people sit, we attached a joystick to, the, to a swivel chair. There. So in all these cases, you had to do real turning. The only difference was here, you were actually moving, and here, you just had to suspend disbelief and think that you were moving. Um, and then we had the walking and the standing cases. And what we found was, okay, the, we looked at a bunch of different things. I don't have time to talk about them all, but we found that people were walked, the, the, the metric was, was the path length, because if you got lost, you would go around and around. If you didn't, you would find everything. People walked shortest with the walking, um, next with the wheelchair, and then these were, um, so, so we, we found this with the, with the walking, and we also looked at the, the revisits. Um, here's the walking. Um, here's the green, is the wheelchair. So we found you know, suggestions that there were advantages to the wheelchair over the, um, the just going with the joystick. And I think I know why, because the thing is that it's all about tricking people and, uh, and, and allowing people to suspend this belief. And if you're in a wheelchair, you can imagine that you're moving, because you really are moving. And if you're sitting in a swivel chair, you have to use more imagination to think that you're moving. And so the automatic, you know, Fundamental instinctive spatial updating processes are not so automatic when you have to, you know, exert more effort to try to make the, the illusion feel real. So I, I think I have to stop. Um, I, we've got a ton of future work. I've got more ideas than, than time and students. Um, but I just want to put up this slide to thank everybody who's helped me. Uh, just so grateful for, for all of that. And, and I have a couple minutes for questions.